sweating. That is one thing I do not have to worry about today. <laughs> so did anyone have any guana fall on them this morning? Apparently that's something else we're supposed to be worried about here in Southwest Florida. We are so incredibly spoiled. If you are new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I'm going to teach you some Greek this morning. You know how to say I'm cold in Greek? Brr, like that. That's it. Same in every language. We all understand that. <laughs> I wonder, does anyone else here have a home theater? Do you have a special place in the house where you have like an extra big TV or maybe a projector and a surround sound system? Do you enjoy that kind of stuff? I think it became really popular when things started to close down for a little while, evidenced by all the big screen TV boxes in my neighborhood <laughs> on the street. Everybody started doing that. And I think we realized some of the benefits of that. One, the TVs nowadays, you can get them for a fairly good price, affordable. They're big, they're bright, and they have a great picture, usually better than the movie theater. If you're like me, it's in a room that is too small. <laughs> so the screen looks really huge. I'm sitting way too close to it. I started doing this before I knew I needed glasses. So <laughs> huge screen, surround sounds pretty good nowadays. You can just crank it up. It feels like the movie theater, like the intro video that we had. It's kind of nice. Food, cheap at home. Popcorn, pretty cheap at home, not like the movie theater where it's like $800,000 to eat there. <laughs> Streaming services, what, 10, 20 bucks a month? Not too bad, less than the price of admission. So there are lots of benefits. The pause button, that's nice. You can't tell the projector guy, hey, I have to go to the bathroom now, right? So at home, you just pause it. You can go to the bathroom, come back. It's convenient. I think we realize this. But when things opened up again, I went to the movie theater. And I realized all of these benefits very quickly. And there are some others. Here in Naples, we have fancy movie theaters where you can reserve the seats before you go. And inevitably, even though this is an option, even though the theater is in full, there will be someone who decides to sit right next to me. I know, oh, you're a pastor, you're supposed to evangelize. Uh, give me two hours where I don't have to be a pastor. I don't want to talk to you for these two hours. That's not what going to the movies is all about. Also in Naples, they allow drinking alcohol at some of the theaters. And this can be a very bad thing because the person sitting next to you who already came in with voice modulation disorder now is drunk. And they're whisper talking, right? So they do that. Hey, this movie's going to be great, right? That's fun. And now because they've been drinking, they have to get up and go to the bathroom. Now, when you do this at the movie theater, especially if you're around my height, it's a little difficult anyway. It's dark. It's disorienting, especially if there's things flickering on the screen. And I feel like I'm going to fall into the other row. I don't know about you, right? So I'm like trying not to touch anybody because that's not allowed anymore. And I'm walking along and trying not to fall. But now try that drunk. Forget it, right? So you're now a human banister for this individual. You know, like, excuse me, right? Might as well just put out my arms here. Hold on to me. Everybody help. The drunk guy get across the seats. The other thing, I thought everybody knew this. Opening the bag etiquette. You don't open the bags, like candy bags, Especially, they're very noisy during the quiet dialogue. No, you wait for an explosion or something like that, right? You do it really quick. But when you're drunk, you forget that etiquette. So what did we learn today? Don't go to the movie theaters drunk. <laughs> it's not polite. It's terrible. Here's my remedy. Don't go drunk. And also, what I do, if I know I'm going to the movie theaters, I hold it until I have to go to the movie theater until the movie's just starting. Then I go to the bathroom, right, right away. 
Don't want to be that guy. Now, you may be thinking, oh, wait a minute, you could miss the movie. Not a chance. Previews. <laughs> Is it just me or are the previews getting longer and longer and longer? In fact, if you don't like using public bathrooms, here's what you can do. You can get to the movie theater, buy your tickets, send everybody in with your snacks, go back home, use your own bathroom, and come back, and I promise you, you won't miss any of the movie. Have you ever gotten through maybe the third, fourth, or fifth preview and then thought to yourself, what did I come here to see again? Is that Yes, it's clearly happened to a lot of you. We're going to talk about previews today. Today we find ourselves <laughs> in the rest. I had to tell a lot of jokes today because we're going to talk about dying. So that's like never happy. I got to like loosen you guys up a little bit. So we're good. Everyone's okay. We're all alive, I think. All right. <laughs> previews. We find ourselves in our series. Last week was awesome. We had Glenn come out and talk to you. He's from Wings of Shelter. Tough ministry, tough topic. I thought he handled it really, really well. Glenn Carver. So he's become a good friend of mine. And we partner up with ministries like that because we can't do absolutely everything, especially difficult ones like that. Lots of moving parts. You're not only dealing with like a housing type of thing, but also very, very deep counseling. And so we try to do what we can here as a church, but our primary mission is the gospel. And we feed people. We try to do other things for the, the community. But when it's really difficult, we bring on ministry partners. So when you give to us, you are also supporting them. Today we find ourselves back in our series, the rest of the story. So two weeks ago, we learned about the Samaritans. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to point out things that most people aren't looking at, but these things unlock other parts of the Bible. So now, by understanding that, King Omri and the purchase of Samaria that becomes the capital city in the north for the Israelites there. So you have Judah in the south. It's kind of like the civil war going on at this time. Now you know why Jesus is saying certain things about Samaritans, the parable of the good Samaritans and things like that. It helps you to understand the gravity and the social or cultural climate going on there. We're going to continue picking up in 1 Kings 16 and look at some other stuff into 1 Kings 17. So we learned briefly that Omri has a son named Ahab. So let's pick up there. 1 Kings 16, 29. Ahab, son of Omri, began to rule over Israel in the 38th year of King Asa's reign. That's in the south in Judah. He reigned in Samaria 22 years. But Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. As though it were not enough to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbal of the Sidonians. Remember that. And he began to bow down in worship of Baal. First, Ahab built a temple and an altar to Baal in Samaria. Then he set up an Asherah pole. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings before him. Tip, don't name your kids Ahab or Jezebel. Not, not great names. You don't want to do that. So a lot of you know about that. But well, we're going to get a little more insight. If you keep reading in that chapter, something kind of interesting. Lonnie probably just found it. <laughs> it's about Jericho. It throws this little thing in there. If you remember in Joshua, the fall of Jericho happens, right? And then what does Joshua do? He pronounces a curse on Jericho. So this is way back. And he says, may the curse of the Lord fall on anyone who tries to rebuild the town of Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay the foundation. At the cost of his youngest son, he will set up the gates. So 1 Kings 16.34 said, It was during his reign, Ahab's reign, that Hiel, a man from Bethel, rebuilt Jericho. 
When he laid its foundations, it cost him the life of his oldest son, Abiram. And when he completed it and set up its gates, it cost him the life of his youngest son, Segub. This all happened according to the message of the Lord concerning Jericho, spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. If we turn the page, enter the prophet Elijah. Now, Elijah doesn't have his own book like some of the other prophets, but he's kind of important. It's kind of a big deal. So we're going to stop here and read about him. 1 Kings 17.1, now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Then the Lord sent to Elijah, Go to the east and hide by Kirith Brook, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped beside Kirith Brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. But after a while, the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. So punishment for Ahab. You're experiencing this really, really bad drought. So we're going to read more about that later. Next week, we'll learn a little bit more about what's going on there, why Elijah's hiding. He's hiding from King Ahab. Now, maybe weird. Ravens are bringing him bread and meat. Like, what is that all about? If you know the word well, you might know that in Leviticus, they talk about a lot of disgusting things. But they also talk about what kinds of animals you can and can't eat, including birds. Ravens are one of these birds you cannot eat, according to the law of Moses. If you want to eat a raven, that's fine. Or an iguana, fine. But according to the law of Moses, apparently you can just harvest them. They're all over the ground right now. (laughs) Stop. Okay. Somebody thought that was funny. Anyway, (laughs) you can't eat ravens. Don't eat them. They're no good for you. They're what? are called unclean animals. So this is interesting. You have unclean animals bringing food to Elijah. This is a preview of something. So now the Lord tells Elijah, go to Zarephath. There's going to be a woman there who will feed you. Zarephath is near Sidon. It's kind of important. It ties in here. So he goes to the town, and he sees a woman. She's gathering sticks, like, for firewood. He says, get me a cup of water to drink. So she's on her way to do that for him. He says, you know what? Get me some bread, too. She says, listen, I only have a little bit of flour left, a little bit of water. I was gathering these sticks to make a fire to cook a last meal for me and my son, and we're going to die. And he's like, it's a famine, right? Do, Do what I told you. This is what the Lord says. There will always be enough flour and olive oil in these containers. She has these containers that she would be filling these things up, storing the stuff to make the bread. Okay. So it happens. It says they have enough to eat for several days. They're just continually eating this stuff. Multiplication of the oil and the flour. Now, this is interesting. Because this woman is a foreigner. She's a Gentile. Remember we talked about the ethne, right? The ethnicities. She is not Jewish. She's not an Israelite. So she is unclean, like the ravens. You see what's going on here. Like the ravens fed Elijah, now she's going to feed Elijah. But now Elijah, through the power of the Lord, multiplies this food. And now the Lord is feeding a Gentile. It's a preview. We'll keep reading. So some time goes by. Her son gets really sick. She's a widow, but she has a son. Her son gets sick, so sick that he dies. Now she gets freaked out. What have you come here to do, to judge my sin and kill my son? Having a prophet around could be a dangerous thing because they can pronounce judgment on anybody, maybe you sometimes. So that's what she's thinking, right? I'm being judged for this. Why did this happen? So Elijah says, give me the boy, takes the boy, brings him up to an upper room where he's staying, lies the boy out, and does something really weird. First he says, well, why have you brought tragedy, Lord, upon this house? (laughs) Then he lays out over the boy. 
Three times it says. That's really weird. It is to us. But in ancient cultures, they had this belief that you could transmit like your spirit for healing by touching a part of your body to their body. So maybe mouth to mouth like resuscitation, but spiritually, it's going to put his breath into the boy's body. Mesopotamian cultures, other cultures like that had this belief. So don't do that now. It's weird. <laughs> I've seen someone actually try to mimic this and do this in church. The person they did it to was not healed, and they never came back again. So just <laughs> please, we've learned. Like, Jesus can heal from afar. Just sit there quietly and pray for the person. That's all you need to do, right? We don't want to freak people out. So we'll, we'll look at that, mimicking things that maybe you shouldn't mimic. But he does it. He prays, like, bring this boy to life, and it happens. The woman... She says, now I know for sure that you're a man of God, and the Lord truly speaks through you. It's a miracle. He brings the boy back to life. Now, sometimes a preacher or teacher will stop there at the preview, and maybe they'll say, oh, God will always provide for you. That's the lesson, right? Or you'll always be healed. Maybe. Maybe they'll say, well, we can be like Elijah, and here's how. One, two, three. If you've been in church for a long time, you've probably heard something like that. They'll just stop at the preview. But here's the thing. We've learned this in the series. We don't want to draw conclusions before we read the rest of the story. It's very important. We talked about drawing conclusions before finishing the book. There's more to it. We shouldn't stop here and develop theology until we've read to the conclusion. When someone presents a gospel, they shouldn't stop short. Whether it be here at Elijah, commonly done with David and Goliath, I bet you've heard that one before, they'll just stop there. You see, when someone presents the gospel, it should always point to Jesus. Always. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. The purpose for all of these accounts is to point to Jesus. Whether it's Elijah, we'll read Elisha, whether it's David, all points to Jesus. These accounts are all previews, prefigures of Christ. Very important to remember. A lot of people don't get that. And so this is what Jesus says to the religious leaders of his time when he was here in the flesh who don't get it. John 5.39, he says, You search the Scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the Scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me and receive this life, eternal life. Jesus says, the Scriptures point to me. Every message, every presentation of the gospel should point to Jesus, or it's not the gospel. When someone cuts the gospel short, we get the tourist trap gospel. We get the half gospel. We get stuck on the preview and miss the main feature. We need to keep reading. A lot of people don't understand this, so it's worth kind of saying. The New Testament clarifies the Old Testament. And even within the New Testament, Paul's writings, for example, as we'll see today, clarify the gospels. Not everything is said. Not every little issue is dealt with. So Paul will clarify these things, saying whether he has a command from the Lord or whether he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and this is what I think is right. But it all clarifies it. Remember, we talked about James and John, the Samaritans, the Samaritan town. They didn't welcome Jesus and his disciples in the town. And so we're going to read about Elijah. They had a preview, and they thought they knew what they should be doing. They're like, oh, well, what did Elijah do? Well, he rained down fire on people. So let's do that. <laughs> These Samaritans aren't letting us in. So we're going to rain down fire on them. Jesus rebukes them. No, 
he clarifies. He doesn't say this explicitly, but yeah, it's great. Elijah did that. Like, you know, the mouth-to-mouth thing. Don't do that. It's not good. We're supposed to love everyone. Jesus clarifies that. We saw it in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said, right? Love your neighbor. Hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Yep, may have said that. But now I say to you, Jesus clarifies. Very important to keep reading. When we cut the Word of God short, we become short-sighted. We miss the point. So these Old Testament accounts give us prefigures. So for example, there are kind of many of them here. Elijah, it's his first miracle, the multiplication of the food, right? So Jesus' first miracle, wedding at Cana, John 2, multiplies the wine. It's just a prefigure of that and others like it. Interesting. Elijah going to a Phoenician woman near Sidon prefigures Jesus' healing of the Syrophoenician woman's child. Daughter's been possessed. It's a prefigure of that. Elijah's food multiplication, as I said, prefigures wedding at Cana, the wine. Also, other food multiplications, like the feeding of the five thousand. Interesting miracle. We see it. John chapter 6. Significant. It's almost the Passover. He's got a lot of people following him around. Goes up on a hill. Notice his 5,000 men. So scholars will say, could be like 15,000 people. Women and children too, right? So 5,000 men, whole bunch of people there. He decides to test one of the disciples. Philip, where are we going to get food for all these people? So he starts calculating. He said, this is going to be 200 denarii. So it's like some versions will say, we got to work for months to get all the food. It's like you got to work for about 200 days wages for all this food. Huh. So Andrew thinks he's smart, Simon Peter's brother. And he goes, we've got five loaves, two fish. Wait a minute, that's not enough. <laughs> so Jesus blesses them. Mark 6, but John 6 says, he gives thanks to God for feeding everyone. And sure enough, everybody gets fed. Food multiplication miracle. Not just that, there are 12 baskets, one for each one of the apostles. 12 baskets of leftovers. Amazing. But we need to keep reading, even within that account. There's more to it than that. So it says they want to make Jesus their king. So he kind of escapes. (laughs) He gets away. The disciples don't know where he is, so they get in a boat to go to the other side of the sea. Jesus then appears to them. It's stormy, wind and waves, and they see Jesus walking on the water. They freak out at first, of course, and he says, don't be afraid. In the Greek, I am. So it's going back to Exodus, I am. What Moses says, do I say to the people you are? I am. And so Jesus is proclaiming his deity. He gets in the boat, and they're right there where they need to be instantly. People keep following around. It says they're following him just because of the miracles. It's the only reason. They're following him because of the previews. They want to see a sign. So Jesus says this. He replies, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you. Not because you understand the miraculous signs, but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Think about it. Don't be so concerned about these miracles I'm doing. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of approval. Signs, signs are signs of things to come. But the people, they get stuck on that instead of the things to come, instead of what it is pointing to. Ooh, look at that. And they just get stuck there instead of what is to come. They're just there for the temporary things. They don't have their minds set on the eternal things. Jesus is always pointing to. 
Don't be so concerned about the perishable things. So the people, they mention the manna from Moses, stuck on these perishable things. They're like, well, Moses gave us manna from heaven. Jesus says, no, the Father gave you the manna from heaven. But it's just a preview. So Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. If we keep reading, for it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. And we'll raise them up on the last day. Like the woman at the well a couple of weeks ago. Jacob's well. Ooh, this is great. How can you have anything better than this? Jesus says, if you drink from that well, you're just going to get thirsty again. But I have the living water that will give you eternal life. Now I am the bread of life. He gives a really hard teaching after that about eating his flesh and drinking his blood and loses pretty much everybody except the 12 disciples. <laughs> They're like, that was a hard teaching, right? So it's like me preaching something very difficult in the next week. Nobody's here. I have 12 people here. <laughs> and they're like, Gene, what are you doing? Don't preach about people eating you. It's weird. You know what Jesus says? You too? You're going to leave too? Go ahead. Doors open. He's serious. So this whole thing, it's about a focus on heavenly things, not earthly things. This is where Jesus is always pointing, heavenly things. You see, we serve the king of heaven, not the king of this world. It's important to understand. This is what Jesus says to Pilate. In John's gospel, right? He has to tell him, no, my kingdom is not here. If it was, well, all my servants would come and basically save me. I have an army. But my kingdom's not here. It's in heaven. In Mark 8, when Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one, the Messiah, he at first gets it right. Who do you say I am, Peter? Well, you're the Messiah. Huh, very good. So then Jesus shifts the focus. Jesus starts predicting his suffering and his death. Think about it. Who do you say I am? You're the Messiah. Great. So here's the thing. I'm going to suffer and die. What? That's crazy. So Peter tries to rebuke him. Like, don't say those things. That's crazy. Jesus turned around, Mark 8, 33, and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter. So this is interesting. Turn around, look at his disciples. So somebody says something stupid, right? And then I don't just go here. No, he makes sure. I want everybody to hear this. I want everybody to hear this. He says to Peter, get away from me, Satan. That's crazy. Calls him Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, <laughs> he said, I want you to just let this sink in. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, your version might say, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? What? Think about that. That is a crazy... Jesus is really not interested in keeping large crowds around. Just, let's just read that again, right? Worth the 30 seconds. Good take. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Then you can follow me. 
You must die. You must die. <laughs> wow. This is Jesus. But if you give up your life, well, there you go. You'll save it. What does it benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Wow. It's like the parable of the sower, the ones that fall amongst the thorns. Concerns of this life and wealth and riches choke out the plant. There are many Many people, unfortunately, who end up serving the God of this world, Satan. A lot of people don't realize that. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan, who is the God, lowercase g, of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Those who don't believe. They aren't able to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. A lot of people don't know that. So let's take a look at 2 Corinthians in that context on our topic today. 2 Corinthians is pretty interesting. There's correspondence in between 1 and 2 Corinthians, these letters going back and forth. Paul has previously had to reprimand them on several topics. Now he's writing to them for two main reasons, the church in Corinth. One, there are false teachers. A lot of people don't realize that. They're like, oh, it's all good. Don't worry about the false teachers. Well, they worried a lot about false teachers in the early church, a lot. And so Paul is going to have to say some crazy things. He calls them super apostles, right? He's mocking them. False teachers coming through. They are only focused on the things of this world. They're out there trying to get money from everybody. So he's going to do a lot to prove his ministry, how hard it is. The other reason is they're dragging their feet on a collection for the church in Jerusalem. He's kind of got to deal with that, like, Hurry up. He's going to make him a little jealous there. But in this context, he begins by talking about his suffering and how God gives him comfort in the suffering. He addresses some practical issues. He didn't want to come again and give them a painful visit. There's the man who is forgiven. I like to think this is the first Corinthians 5 guy who got kicked out of the church. Just forgive him. Let's reconcile. Then he starts talking about the glory of the new covenant versus the old covenant. All right, so the old covenant, it was glorious, so glorious that Moses had to wear a veil over his face. It would shine for the people. They'd get, whoa, Moses, your face is shining. But yeah, even so, though, it was still veiled. It was behind a veil. But now through Christ, it is unveiled. We have access through the Son of God to God. It's wonderful and glorious. He starts talking about these false teachers again, suffering for the gospel, being a slave for the sake of the gospel. He's trying to put down these false teachers. He's talking about the fragility of their bodies through the suffering. Talks a lot about dying. These dying bodies, though they're decaying, we're looking forward to the glory that is in Christ Jesus. Not like these other teachers, because these guys, they're just concerned about material stuff and physical stuff and the stuff of this world. We're concerned with the glory of Christ. And so he says this, 2 Corinthians 4 or 5. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your, it says servants, <clears throat> wrong, slaves in Greek, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. So remember the veil in context. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. He talks about the weakness of these dying bodies versus the eternal life that they're really striving for, suffering, like Jesus said in Mark 8. But they have the hope of eternal life. So, 
2 Corinthians 4, 16, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. There are no chapter breaks or numbers in the originals. So we turn the page, but he just keeps going to 2 Corinthians 5. Now, <laughs> there are a lot of bad teachings that come out of a verse in particular in 2 Corinthians 5. When someone doesn't give you the context that I just gave you, when they don't understand what's happening, they just take one line out, like imagine doing that, taking a, one line out of a movie, like let's say it's just some horribly sad movie, and then making it about something funny. <laughs> it wouldn't be funny, but that's what people do. Paul's gravity here is immense. People will do this, 2 Corinthians 5.17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new creation. <laughs> and then they'll apply that to healing. I'm a new creation. I don't experience any of these things anymore. Now, not only did they take the verse out of context, they cut the verse short too. Because when we look at it, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new creation, a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. <laughs> this is about not sinning so much. You're not the old person you were. You are a new creation in Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit. It's not about healing our bodies. It's about our sin, not being in sin, being reconciled to God. That's a big word in 2 Corinthians 5. I'm not going to try to say it in Greece, Greek, but I can read it. <laughs> she knows that's funny because if I try to say it, I'll destroy it. <laughs> We're ambassadors of Christ. Reconciliation. We'll talk about that later. So they cut even the verses short. If we read this in light of what we saw in chapter 4, we're like fragile clay jars. Paul, he's going to now refer to our bodies as tents. Tents. Something very temporary. 2 Corinthians 5.1 For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, just in case you didn't understand, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, when we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. We will live in these earthly... While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan inside. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this. And as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight, believing, not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident and we'd rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we will be at home with the Lord. Let that sink in. It's a lot like what Paul is saying in Philippians 1. <laughs> I would rather, he's in prison, I would rather just die because then I can get to go and be home with the Lord. But for your sake, I think I'll stick around for a little while. That's an interesting perspective. But it's his perspective over and over and over again. Let these verses sink in. I would rather be away from this dying body so that I can be home with the Lord. Why don't we hear this in church a lot nowadays? It's weird. Because the Bible talks about it a lot from Jesus to Paul. This isn't it. Why? Why is it a tent? <laughs> We're just passing through. We're sojourning, fancy word. Right? We're just passing through. We're kind of like traveling salespeople selling the gospel. 
We don't want to get too fixed here. This is not our permanent home. It's a temporary residence. First Peter, read that. It says it over and over and over and over again. Side note, on this journey, we are passing through. It's okay to appreciate the things of this world. That's fine, but not like the thorns. So a few things. We don't want to get too attached to things here. We don't want to let them trap us, the thorns. We don't want to worship them. That's important. What we spend our time seeking is what we really worship. It's important to remember that. We should be seeking first the kingdom of God at all times. So we coexist with these temporary things, but we can't let them trap us. We have to stay within God's guardrails, so to speak. Our anticipation should be in the eternal life in Christ. If we put our hope in the things of this world, we will always be disappointed. Always, always, our hope should never, ever be there. But Christ will never disappoint. Never. That's where the hope should be. So on this note of passing through, I want to give you a proverb. There's a little bit of wisdom on this. Proverbs 37. Oh God, I beg you two favors from you. Let me have them before I die. First, let me never tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, who is the Lord? And if I'm too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. Proverbs, very practical. We're ultimately headed home to the Lord. That's why Paul calls the body a tent, a fragile clay jar. Now, we saw that Elijah raised a boy from the dead. Why? It's interesting then. He's going to die anyway. Why raise him? Well, we saw that it was a prefigure for what Jesus was going to do. Well, then why did Jesus raise anybody from the dead? Well, he did. Look at John 11, Lazarus, an interesting account. When we look at that account, there's a lot going on there, so I don't have too much time for that this morning, but I'm going to simplify it for you. Martha and Mary, his sisters, Lazarus' sisters, they send word to Jesus because they know he can heal people, right? Lazarus, your friend, he's sick. Come heal him is what they want. <laughs> so Jesus doesn't. And so there's some dialogue going on. And then Jesus lets them know he's sleeping. And they don't get it. They're like, well, if he's sleeping, he's going to get better. Ah, what Jesus is doing is waiting till Lazarus dies. Think about that for just a second. He lets Lazarus die. He says, I'm going to do this essentially so that now you can see the glory of the Son of Man, so that people will believe. But think about it. He lets Lazarus die. Well, so finally he decides to go. The disciples are a little bit worried because it's in Judea, Bethany, and they're worried they're going to stone him to death as they tried to do. And he says, no, let's go. Dialogue between Mary and Martha going back and forth. Finally he gets to the tomb. And he says, roll away the stone. Martha being very practical. She says, it's going to stink. He's been in there four days. <laughs> She's practical, isn't she? Four days. He's been dead. <sighs> Roll away the stone. He prays to God out loud, makes a funny comment. He's like, Father, I know you always hear me, but for these people's sake, so that they believe, this is what's going to go down. They roll the stone away. Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus does. He's wrapped up like a mummy. And he comes out. Unwrap him. It's a miracle. Unbelievable. Dead, four days. Raises this guy up. But the circumstances are interesting. He lets Lazarus die. As great as this was, 
it's just a prefigure. It's just a preview for what's to come in Christ. Within this text, there's something very interesting. And depending on what version, if you listen to it, it it's funny. They render it in a funny way. It, it can be funny, but it's dead serious. <laughs> they're worried that they're going to get stoned in Judea. Not that kind of stone. They're going to get hit with... <laughs> so drunk, you guys are terrible. <laughs> uh, they're worried they're going to get stones thrown at them and, and die. So Thomas, he's like, okay. <laughs> John eleven sixteen. 16, Thomas named the twin, or Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. Interesting. So if you rendered it seriously, well, let's go too and die with Jesus. It's not about this life here. You see, you have to keep reading. Jesus clarifies on this point to Martha. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. It's a preview. We too will be raised from the dead if we are in Christ Jesus. As great as it was, it's just a preview. You see, we are going to be raised into eternal life. We have to think about that. If we're a tent, <laughs> that's great. We can pray for healing. We do here at C3 Church. We have a prayer list. We start the staff meeting that way. We don't do anything before we pray. And we pray for your needs. We pray for healing. Yes. But no matter how many times God patches this tent, it's still a tent. That's it. You see, we put our hope in eternal life. If you put it in the tent, you're going to be disappointed a lot. All your doctor visits, all these other things, constant disappointment. It's just a tent. That's it. So we need to put our hope in the resurrection. We need to put our hope in the kingdom of heaven I'll wrap up here. I want to wrap up with Scripture the way Paul did. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15. I want to give you this focus this morning, give you this hope as we go out and we do our things in the world. I want you to remember this. Paul talks about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. It's a very, very, very important chapter. He just gives you a preview, a little rundown of the gospel. And this question is raised we're going to have new heavenly bodies. That's what it says, right, in the Bible. We're going to get a new heaven and a new earth. We're going to die. But guess what? So is the whole world. If you read to the end of the story and you read the rest of the story, if you get Peter, between that and Revelation, you'll understand that the whole earth is just going to be like melted in fire. That's it. It's over. Then those in Christ, well, everyone's going to get raised up. And if you've been bad, you're a goat, well, you're going to get judged. It's going to be bad. But if you're in Christ, yeah, you'll get judged, but it's okay. You get to go into the new heaven and the new earth. Beautiful paradise. Wonderful. So the question's raised, though. When I get raised up, what is this new body going to be like? So Paul, he answers this question in a beautiful way. He makes kind of a comparison between like planting a seed in the ground. You see, we have to die like that if we want the plant to grow up. You can't get a beautiful plant to grow up if you don't bury the seed in the ground. So in the same way, our dying bodies need to go in the ground in order to, we need to die in order to experience this new heavenly body. And he continues with something beautiful that I want to leave you with this morning. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. What I am saying dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 
These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.